Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the meeting of the Minnehaha County Commission. I'll call the meeting to order at the Pledge of Allegiance. everyone. Um, we have meeting documents available for review down next to Commissioner Karski. It's just a reminder to silence your cell phone. And Craig is here this morning if you need a listening device. So that will take us to routine business. I'd consider a motion to approve the agenda. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, roll call vote, please. Clark? Aye. Seneca? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. For those of you who are attending, <coughs> excuse me, via Zoom, if you're not speaking right now, could you please mute your line? There's a lot of background noise that we're getting in the commission meeting this morning. Thank you. All right. Next item is um, item two to approve the commission meeting minutes for October 20th, 2020. Move for approval. <coughs> excuse me. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Benega? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. <coughs> Aye. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And I just want to let the folks that are attending via Zoom um, also know that we don't have visuals for you this morning, and so you, I can't rely on seeing you raise your hand or wave at me, so you'll just have to really speak up. I appreciate that. It takes us to item three, bills to the, be paid in the amount of $2,028,056.03. Pay the bills. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? No comment. Thank you. Oh, now I get to see Commissioner Barth again. Sort of, kind of. All right, motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Heiberger? Aye. Karski? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, next item are reports. We've got the Human Services, a Minnehaha County third quarter report, and Lincoln County third quarter report, Juvenile Detention Center, September report, and third quarter report. Those reports all have great information in them. I really appreciate um, all the work that goes into providing those and would recommend those for um, folks' re review. Next item, item five, personnel actions. I'd consider a motion to approve the routine personnel actions. Motion to approve. Second, Jeff. Motion and a second. Um, any comments, questions? Roll call vote, please. Karski? Aye. Barth? Aye. Benega? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is to authorize the commission chair to sign agreements with Horizon, Sanford, Avera, and UMR effective for January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2023 for the health for the county's health plan. Carrie Deaver. Good morning, Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. Today I'm asking for approval on these um, contracts or amendments to contracts for the operation of our health plan. You all recall, of course, that we're a self-insured entity and that we work with several different groups in order to make our health plan work. Horizons helps us with coordinating the network. We have UMR, who's our third-party administrator, and then we've had very good working relationships with both Avera and Sanford as the care systems that we offer to our employees. Every three years, we negotiate rates for them, and they have agreed, they've all agreed to a new three-year contract, so we're asking your approval on the rates and two new contracts, one is for Sanford, where there really is not any significant changes to the contract language itself, and then the other one is for Horizons, where the only change in the contract is the dates, and both those new contracts have been reviewed by our civil office. Questions for Carrie? I would move for approval. Second. We have a motion and second. I'd just like to say thank you to Carrie and her staff. This is, um, there are a lot of contracts here that make our health plan work so well for our employees. Um, we have a tremendous option where employees can choose a provider 
and um, we run it on a self-insured basis, which really keeps it as affordable as possible for employees. And that doesn't happen magically. It, it's a fair bit of um, contracts of getting everybody to work together and make sure the system operates seamlessly. So just really thank you for your work on that. Well, thank you to, thank you for that. And also want to ex extend again our gratitude to both care systems who've been very, very good to work with. Um, this is probably a good time to mention that during the, our process, we know that, and this is, of course, outside any of these wonderful partners, but unfortunately, our health plan has had some higher expenses over the last couple of years. I do want to mention that even though we budgeted for a 15% increase for health insurance premiums next year, um, we have completed our analysis and think that we can get by with just 12% for our health plan and in, for our insurance itself and for our dental 3%. So we'll be doing open enrollment here starting in early November through about the 25th and the employees can look for their materials here probably by the end of the week. I know a 12% increase doesn't sound like good news, but it actually is good news compared to what we were looking at. And that's part of being a self-insured plan is that you have good years. We had years where we were able to give premium holidays, and then we have years where um, true expenses indicate that we have to have an increase. So It does. And, and I looked back at that historically, and we're still at an average of 4% increase per year for the last 10 years. And so I think it was just our time, and we knew last year this was coming. Um, hopefully this will be the last larger increase that we'll need to get back on track. Um, still 75% of our employees who are electing insurance too, so I think that goes to show we offer a good product for, for fairly affordable premiums. All right, so we had a motion and a second. Any other comments? All right, roll call vote, please. Barth. Aye. Benega. Aye. Heiberger. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, item six, abatements recommended for approval. There are none. Item seven, notices and requests. There are none. Item eight, planning and zoning notices. There are none. Item nine, petition for compromise of lien. There are none. That takes us to opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here today who would like to speak? Any item in public comment? Does not appear there's anyone here for public comment, so that will take us to regular business. In the first item, item 10, is a briefing on the 2019 Minnehaha County Fiscal Compliance Audit. Josh Shellam here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joshua Shellam. I'm with the Department of Legislative Audit, and I am here to report to you that uh, our we have finished the annual financial and compliance audit for Minnehaha County for the year 2019. Our audit report is finished and will be released later today. What I have for you today is the management letter, which serves to communicate to you deficiencies noted in internal control, violations of laws, regulations, rules, um, provisions, or contracts, or of grant agreements. And if, as you'll notice on page two of the management letter, which I believe you all have a copy of, we did not note, it, note any deficiencies in internal controls um, that were material weakness or significant deficiencies that would be included in our audit report, nor did we note deficiencies in internal control that we deemed important enough to be included in this letter. There were no material violations of laws, rules, regulations, provisions of contracts or grant agreements um, that, are, that are included in the audit report, uh, nor did we note any immaterial uh, violations that we included in this letter either. Um, I would like to thank the county for its cooperation during our audit, and at this time I'd like to ask if you have any questions for me. Commissioner Benega. Uh, Josh, just one of the questions I would have is when you do your audit, you establish a scope of what you consider errors or whatever. Correct. <laughs> Can you tell me what your scope was this year? Uh, for this year, our material materiality calculation was 5% of assets and revenues depending on the class of transaction we were testing. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Madam Chair, it's Jeff here. Yes, Commissioner Barth. So I appreciate this report and honestly in reading it, um, I'm not always certain exactly what it all means. A bunch of it is actually sort of a required boilerplate, right? So at what point in this report does it say the uh, the, uh, the issues 
that you found? Is that the, what we're looking at now, the deficiencies? Because there is plenty of uh, uh, sort of annual uh, annual boilerplate that goes on these reports. Right. This this letter indicates that we do not have any any material. Uh, material weakness or significant deficiencies that will be included in our audit report. So there, there will be no written comments in the audit report, um, and we did not find anything we deem necessary to bring to the attention of the board either. Uh, I know in previous previous audits That's there were. Okay. So Commissioner Bennett or hi, Commissioner Barth, I'm sorry, we didn't quite hear your last comment. I just said that's all I need because. Uh, there's a lot of verbiage which appears to be annual uh, verbiage, and uh, I just want to make sure I'm cutting to the chase, so to speak. So I'm very happy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Commissioner Beniga. I would just say boring is a good thing for an audit report. I agree. <laughs> and I appreciate the fact that we have eliminated the concerns we've had from prior years. and. It shows that we've made some improvements in what we've tried to accomplish. So thank you for the report. Absolutely, thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that takes us to item 11, which is a motion to approve the 2020 One Sioux Falls budget supplement. <coughs> Lori Montes. Morning, Commission. Lori Montes, Human Services. Can you all hear me? We can, yes. Thank you, Lori. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so uh, you probably recall that we have to date um, accepted $400,000 from the One Sioux Falls Fund, which is administered by the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation. Um, as of this morning, we have spent about 398000 of that 400000 in helping about 365 households. Um, with rent, utility, and mortgage assistance. Um, and so what the uh, One Sioux Falls Fund folks is, are asking is that um, we take basically the remaining um, funds that they have in that account. They have about 288000 and some odd dollars um, left in the account, but uh, asking that we accept 288000 more dollars to continue to fund uh, folks in the Sioux Empire area that are needing assistance with rent, mortgage, and utility. Um, and one thing that I wanted to just say in regards to this, because you perhaps have heard of the South Dakota CARES Fund um, that started as of last week, which has $10 million um, that's to go to people across the state of South Dakota for assistance um, with these same things, rent, mortgage, and utility. Um, and actually, I think the, um, the state looked at the one Sioux Falls parameters and how that had worked in determining um, kind of some guidance for how they would manage um, the fund statewide. So um, I guess basically now that there is that South Dakota CARES Fund in place, um, what we are doing from Human Services is initially referring people to that fund since there is that $10 million. Um, also, their um, income limits are um, substantially larger, um, certainly than counties, um, federal poverty level guidelines of 100%, um, and the One Sioux Falls Fund uses 200% of federal poverty level. The South Dakota CARES Fund um, goes by um, uh, average uh, income, and so their amounts are are um, way higher than that. I think for one person, it's an income of about $62,000 for a one person household. Um, and so we are referring to that fund when people call in. Um, initially, if you look in the memo that I submitted um, last week, one of the things that the South Dakota CARES Fund was not going to be able to assist with um, were the uh, government um, utilities. And so, uh, such as the city of Sioux Falls, water, sewer, um, the few people that have uh, electric through the city of Sioux Falls, they weren't going to be able to assist with that. And so we thought that that would be um, an area of unmet need. However, um, since that um, came out last week, now at the end of last week, they decided uh, they 
found a way to kind of overcome that barrier. So they are able now to assist with those municipality um, um, utility expenses. So uh, that's no longer, that piece that's in the memo is no longer um, current. So they can assist with that. Um, but for people who um, either just come into the office um, on a walk-in basis, or maybe they filled out an application and submitted it um, to us through email, um, we can certainly still process that. And if we had the one Sioux Falls um, fund money still available to us for those folks that uh, whose situation is COVID related, we would still be able to assist with one Sioux Falls if we are able to accept this remaining $288,000. I would anticipate that that just because of um, the other funds available that that would give it, get us through um, for sure the end of this year, which is when um, the MOU that we um, did back in August. Um, I think it, I think the verbiage there is that it expires at the end of the year or when funds are expended. Um, so this might even carry us into early 2021 because we obviously don't know what's going to happen then. Um, with our, our community's needs and um, the South Dakota CARES funds, um, you have to apply by uh, mid-December, December 18th, I believe it is, um, to get those funds. So I'm um, certainly open to questions if there's things that I can help answer, but really just looking um, for us to be able to accept that, that last amount that's really in the One Sioux Falls Fund at this point. Um, I think they are planning to leave it open just because we don't know what will happen. So the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation will continue to have that fund. And should things, you know, ramp up in our area and we need additional funds, they may, you know, decide to solicit additional donations for that. Um, but at this point, anyway, it's kind of, if we would accept that $288,000, it would be pretty much um, emptying out, I guess, that, that fund. So questions or thoughts on that that you guys have for me? Questions for Bender? Bender, I have a comment. Commissioner Heiberger. I just, I just want to tell our citizens, you know, this is because of the forward thinking of the city of Sioux Falls. These are not taxpayer dollars, but they were gifts from businesses and individuals who, um, and a fund was set up at the Sioux Falls Community Foundation realizing that going into COVID clear back in March that there would be people who would really be struggling. And so people gave money and that's how this fund was established. And um, I just, you know, give high praise to the people who were thinking forward and gave that money to help people out who are in struggling situations. And I also thank the city for, um, for having faith in us to distribute this money through the human services department and thank our people there who are doing the hard work to do it. All right, thank you. Commissioner Benninger? Madam Chair, this is Jeff. Commissioner Barth. I would ask uh, Laurie if uh, there are some uh, grave areas that uh, we did not have a safety net for. Uh, uh, I really, really appreciate the community pulling together to uh, try to help some of us. Uh, I have not needed help, thank goodness. But uh, are we dropping the ball in any way on on, uh, on these programs where some people are really being uh, left in dire straits? That's my question. Um, well, certainly for people who've been affected by COVID, um, which are um, you know a substantial number. So if their financial situation has been affected by COVID, I think um, those people. Um, have had certainly the, uh, the ability to access some additional resources. I think there are always those folks in our community who um, continue to struggle, and that's the people that are on um, limited income, like on disability income. Um, their finances weren't affected by COVID, um, and so they're not uh, eligible for any of those COVID-related funds necessarily, but we know that they you know, are challenged month to month just to get by in order to afford their rent and their living expenses um, based on the limited social security income that they may have. So that is a group that um, we continue to see um, and whether we can assist them or not, or, uh, you know, give them referrals to other 
helping agencies in our community that might assist them. Um, I think that is one of the needs that uh, is still out there, certainly. Other questions? Commissioner Beniga. Uh, Lori, can you tell us how many people you've served so far and how many uh, people have accessed the, not only the foundation dollars, but also the CARES grant? Um, the CARES fund, I do not know. Um, that just started uh, last Thursday at noon is when they started accepting applications for that. That goes through the Helpline Center. Um, I know we have certainly done a number of referrals since Thursday uh, to people who are calling in um, with COVID-related situations. Um, as far as numbers we have served, I don't have um, in front of me numbers um, total to human services. I think um, some good numbers were in those third quarter reports uh, that Jamie submitted. Um, but the number of households we've assisted just for once who falls um, is that 365. Um, and that's in two months. Remember that we started uh, assisting once who falls uh, with once who falls funds as of mid August. So that's in a couple months. We've helped 365 or households through that, through that fund in particular. Uh, thank you. I just wanted the question uh, that I've had some feedback about is how long does it take after an application is made before they actually receive the funding? Through one to fall? Yes. Through us? Um, so we process that just like we do uh, regular county applications. So we um, do require, you know, some documentation, whether it's um, documentation of uh, reduced income or um, landlord verifications, that kind of thing. And so once the um, needed documentation is submitted, then uh, the, the uh, caseworkers have five days to make that determination. Um, I can say it typically ha uh, happens much more quickly than that once they have the documentation in their hands. Um, and then it's just a matter of processing it through our system. So. Um, it then once they are approved, um, just goes like, you know, like our typical voucher system. So it takes another um, probably up to two weeks, um, 10 days or so to get uh, the funds actually to the landlord or to the utility provider. Thank you. Any other questions? So Lori, just kind of to recap, what I thought I heard you say is that um, frequently, if people come in and just ask where they should start, you're recommending that, that people affected by COVID start by applying for the South Dakota CARES Fund right now, and that that application is submitted through the Helpline Center. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then, secondly, depending on income levels, would be the ones who falls fund or the, the regular county assistance for COVID-affected individuals? Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. All right. Anything else? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further comments? Roll call vote, please. Benega? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Karski? Aye. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, Lori, we all just echo Commissioner Heiberger's comments about thanks to you and your staff for this hard work, this extra work that you guys have willingly taken on. And you're obviously doing a great job since uh, they keep giving you more money. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, that takes us to item 12, which is to authorize the chairperson to sign a change order with J.E. Dunn for North Frontage Improvements. Carol Muller, I think. I know Carol is here, so we'll give her a minute or two.
There she is. Hello. Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller, Commission Office. Before you today is a request to authorize the chairperson to sign a change order with J.E. Dunn for a North Frontage improvements on the jail. For your consideration, this is an owner authorized transfer, which means that it is um, coming out of the construction contingency. The good news with this project is that even with spending this money, which is $520,000, that we will still be underneath budget. So a little bit bigger than the ones we normally see for coming out of contingency. Um, the county is being proactive about heavy rain events. We are doing some reconfiguration in the front of the jail including a 30-inch high wall that will encompass the sidewalk and the four entrances into the jail, a floodgate which will automatically raise upon water pressure, and a collection pump system to remove any heavy rain that accumulates within the wall. Um, you'll also see to the west of the jail some landscaping work being done with the wall continuation and disappearing into a berm. So before you today is a request to authorize the chairperson to sign this change order or the owner authorized transfer. Thank you. Are there any questions for Carol? All right. <laughs> She's leaving, so it's a good thing there aren't any questions. Um, so, you know, obviously this is, change orders aren't necessarily fun, but this is something that we've vetted out extensively and feel um, is in the best interest of protecting the investment we've got in the jail facilities, both the existing jail and the addition. So any comments, questions? Move approval. Second. It's motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Kyberger? Aye. Harsky? Aye. Barth? Aye. Senega? Aye. Sanders? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item, item 13, is to authorize the chair to sign agree an agreement for highway for financial tracking software with Tyler Technologies. DJ Boothie. Good morning, Commissioner. DJ Boothie, Highway Superintendent. It looks like the wrong uh, PDF file is up on the screen. If, if somebody wants to maybe change that, that's for item 14, the next one. Uh, Back in June of 2020, the highway department identified some, some issues with uh, project funding and, and tracking the funding for different contracts and, and purchases. And so uh, we had a series of meetings with the auditor's office, information technology, and a couple different vendors uh, to try to find a better solution for uh, what we were essentially doing with the spreadsheet today. And uh, after a series of meetings and and some demonstrations that Tyler Technologies uh, held for us. Uh, we identified uh, Tyler Technology solution. And so this request is to authorize the chairperson to sign the work order for Tyler Technologies. What we're uh, planning on doing is currently we own purchase orders, uh, contract and grant accounting and project management modules for, for Munis. Uh, they have not been implemented and they're not currently being used. And so we would like to have those implemented or, or set up for use. And then uh, also another module that we do not currently own is the contract management solution or the contract management module. Uh, we'd like to purchase that and also implement that. And so uh, all of these different modules, they don't double up on, on tools. They, they all have their own unique functions and they will allow us to input a whole bunch of information on projects and purchasing and then uh, run real-time reports on encumbrances and, and compare all of that to what our budget numbers are. It will also allow us to project out for future years. Uh, we can input the information from our five-year plan into the Munis and, and really have a good idea of what our cash flow will look like for the next up to five years if we, if we chose to go out that far. Uh, so with that, I'll, I think Monty's on the line also. Uh, he, he might be able to field some questions if you all have any questions, and I'll stand by for questions as well. Thank you. Monty, did you have anything to add? Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, Monty Wattenbach with uh, Minnehaha County IT. Um, just at a real high level, uh, and to stay brief, um, I'm supportive of highway purchasing these modules. Um, I think it would 
I do believe it will suit their needs. Um, and I won't get into any details, but we'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions for DJ or um, Monty Gerald, Commissioner uh, Benega? Monty, I'm assuming that the software that we're purchasing for the highway department networks with the Tyler software that we're currently using? Uh, correct, yes. These are actually just additional modules, some of which we um, have the licensing for but aren't necessarily configured for how highway needs to use them. Um, that one being the purchase order module. Um, so the answer to your question is yes, all a part of Tyler Munis um, and diff just different modules that um, allow you to, you know, uh, just uh, take care of the various different functions that they need that, um, you know, we just really haven't needed with other departments uh, just due to highways unique uh, needs and ability to track their projects. So the bottom line is, is that we'll be able to do some more longer term forecasting of cash needs, but more importantly, it's a, an efficient tool that the highway department can also use. For yeah, I think highway basically. will probably be the biggest use of most of these modules. There might be some other groups. Uh, they just have a lot more requirements, you know, when they're keeping track of uh, their projects, um, they're just, it's just a lot more complicated to keep track of the overall cost of the project as it's going along and the different pieces of that from um, contracted out um, aspects of it. Um, they're just complicated to keep track of. And they want to make sure that when they start down that um, uh, road, they can use the purchasing order module to encumber the entire cost of that project um, yet, as they're going through it, to keep track of uh, the details um, and where uh, funds are being allocated and to what aspects of the project. Outside of that, DJ would probably have to, to explain more details, but that's, that's the best way I can explain it. Well, that's fine. Thank you. And I would, I would add, just as the highway liaison, I I have had conversations with DJ about this, and I think it's one of those things where um, after, after we did our ERP, we realized how um, the great efficiencies that the Tyler products have provided and other departments that um, it became clear that it would be helpful if there was a product that would interface with the auditor's office and with our other um, budgeting and financial software, but that would specifically help highway, as Monty said, as they manage projects and as, you know, as they're spending money and trying to figure out exactly how much they've committed to spend and where they are in real time in the midst of a project. And that's really uh, what this will allow them to do. It will allow projects to be, to be um, more transparent so that everybody can understand in real time where we are at any on any given day on a project. So I'm very supportive of, of doing this. I think it's, um, it's both a complement to the things that we've learned through the Tyler products as they've been in place and, and through that gaining confidence um, by the highway department that this is a tool that they could really use to benefit their operations. Any other questions or comments? I would make a motion to approve. <clears throat> we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments, questions? Roll call vote, please. Karski? Aye. Barth? Aye. Benega? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So the next item, we have um, DJ back. The next item is to authorize the chair to sign a reimbursement and expense agreement with the South Dakota Department of Transportation for highway repair and maintenance. DJ. Uh, commissioners, every year when we do our, our uh, pavement preservation projects, if we're near a municipality or near state highways, uh, in this case specifically near the Crooks-Renner I-90 exit, um, or I-29 exit, uh, 
every year we contact those other agencies and ask if, if it makes sense for us to extend our project limits into their jurisdictional area. Um, uh, oftentimes we've worked with the city of Sioux Falls, uh, the city of Hartford, and the city of Brandon uh, to do this. And uh, in this case, we extended our mill and overlay project approximately 630 feet into the state's jurisdiction. And, uh, and the way that we do that is, is just ask the contractor to do that work and then we figure out the quantities uh, that were used for that particular piece of, of the project and then we build the, the governing or the jurisdictional agency after the project is complete. So uh, that being said, we had about 630 feet of this project, which equates to $20,413.02 uh, that the state will be reimbursing us for. Uh, we need the uh, would like to request the chairperson to sign the reimbursement agreement so the state can cut the check to the high department or to the Minnehaha County. Move approval. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to authorize you to sign this agreement and like getting reimbursed. I'll second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments or questions? All right, roll call vote, please. Barth? Aye. Benega? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, DJ. That takes us to item 15, which is to authorize the chair to sign an interim agreement for architectural services for the administration and extension buildings with JLG Architects. Craig, good morning. Good morning, Craig Dewey, Commission Office. Uh, after an RFP process and interviews, uh, JLG Architects were selected as the architect for the remodel of the administration and extension building. Uh, we have agreed to verbal terms for the uh, ongoing uh, design process. However, uh, before that a more permanent contract gets put in place, there's the interim agreement that's before you today. The interim agreement dates uh, have been uh, set so that it would expire no later than uh, November 30th. We anticipate that we will bring forward the full agreement prior to the end of November. So the interim agreement lists uh, different hourly rates as, as a way to make sure that uh, JLG would get reimbursed. Uh, Tegra, our owner's representative, has uh, been in negotiations with JLG and as I indicated, uh, favorable terms were agreed uh, to with JLG for the ongoing agreement. Uh, this has been reviewed by uh, outside legal counsel. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Craig? This is a similar process to what we did with the jail where we did an interim agreement as we negotiated the long extensive agreement so that work could start immediately. It worked fine in that in, um, setting and I know our outside legal counsel is, is comfortable with using this um, agreement. It's kind of a stop gap. I know Craig's already got the 50, 60, 70 page agreement, the real agreement that he's um, plowing through right now. So this will just be for a few weeks. It's kind of like yesterday. Shark Tank, you agree to the preliminary and then you gotta sit down. Yeah, it's kind of like the letter of intent, yeah. yep. I would say that it's nice to see it even this far because I don't know how long we've been look, looking at that since we had the USD study <coughs> and all the components of that. It seems like we finally got to the track rather than working on the sidelines. It is very exciting. And we had great architects that interviewed for this. JLG brings a lot of experience to the table with very similar remodel kinds of projects. So I think we're real excited. It will be, you know, it will require a lot of patience on the part of our employees living through a remodel is never anybody's um, idea of a great time, but the end results should really be worth it, so. Any other questions or comments? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Motion and second. Thank you, Commissioner Heiberger. Anything else? Any other comments, questions? Roll call vote, please. Benega? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. That takes us to item 16, which are liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports this morning? Madam Chair. Oh, Commissioner Barth. Yeah, we had a planning and zoning meeting last night. It was uh, in most ways uneventful. There uh, 
we approved a Airbnb that had a one letter in opposition, but uh, we uh, insisted on more off-street parking for whoever comes to stay there. And uh, other other than that, uh, everything else went through without any objection. Thank you. Any other? Commissioner Karski. <clears throat> Yes, this morning, Commissioner Heiberger and I met with uh, Tracy Smith and the Public Defender's Advisory Board. We had a good meeting. Um, financially, the Public Defender's Office um, budget looks great. Um, unfortunately, since March, there have been seven homicides in Minnehaha County that um, we will probably be looking at greater expenditures in 2021. Um, so trying to figure out the best way to tie money to these trials so that we can properly account for the expenses associated with each one. Uh, another big project going on, they have literally hundreds of bankers boxes in the public safety building that they're trying to convert into electronic files. Um, just moving the boxes, I mean, if you ever dealt with a bankers box, they're um, the size of a file cabinet drawer, very heavy and just trying to get them to the right place and get them accounted for properly and get them electronically converted. Um, so project that they're working on, we took some action to approve a few things there. The big thing is they're out of room. They're literally busting at the seams. Um, and it's mostly because of, at, the at, at this time, poorly designed floor plan at the time that it was designed it worked great but at this point we need to look at some changes so the building committee will be seeing some requests for some changes to the what you could call a basement or they call it the garden room at the at the um, public defenders building um, to gut the lowest level and to convert those into more functional usable office space so where do we move people in the interim and you know, look at what the cost is and we'll know more about that within the next week or 10 days. So by the hopefully November building committee meeting, we have some things to talk about. So. Okay, good. Anything that, that I missed, uh, Commissioner Heiberger? I think you covered most of it. There was a lot of little items, but I think that covers the bulk of it. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, thank you. Other liaison reports? I would just note that as liaison to the sheriff, I sat in on um, interview for jail medical provider. Um, our current jail medical provider has indicated that they um, will not be renewing their contract, which expires at the end of this year. So we had a really uh, good informative interview last um, Friday with a local provider. And so uh, we are um, we'll be moving forward and trying to negotiate a contract with that group, and then um, we'll bring that contract to the commission for approval. So I think the um, I think it's fair to say that um, the warden and the sheriff's office are excited about the opportunity to work with a local provider instead of one of these national medical providers. Uh, staffing is a constant um, issue over there, and there's. Uh, a great deal of optimism that working with a local provider will help us to um, deal with the incredible turnover that they've had to experience over there. So, so I appreciate the opportunity to be part of that process. I, I learned a lot, <laughs> I'll tell you. So anyway, very interesting. It's, a, it's amazing the commitment uh, that people have to provide um, medical services <coughs> at a, a highly accredited level uh, to folks that are, you know, coming into the jail, a, a really a population that a lot of times has um, not kept up with medical needs, and and it's a real opportunity to make an impact on people's lives for the better. So, I appreciate that. All right, any other liaison reports? All right, that takes us to new business. Any new business? could do this, I guess, under new business. I mean, in conjunction with receiving our auditor's report today, as soon as the auditor's, uh, as soon as the audit report from the state, as soon as we received that report, the auditor's office sent that off to Moody's, um, who does uh, the uh, rating for our bonds. They had been asking for it. And so we received a letter uh, where Moody's assigned uh, an A, 
A1 rating to the county, um, to all operations, which it was really great to see uh, them continue to recognize the hard work that we do to be responsible with our finances here at the county. So that indicates that our bonds are at a high quality and subject to very low credit risk. So that will be um, great for us as we uh, go out for future bond issues. And it's a real credit to um, a lot of the hard work that goes on down in the auditor's office to um, helping us put together and, and stick to a, a responsible budget. So I appreciate all, the, all of that hard work. Um, old business, any old business? No meeting next Tuesday. There is no meeting next Tuesday. There's an election next Tuesday. So this um, building, the building across the street and the building next to that will be a, a hive of activity, um, but there will be no commission uh, meeting next week. In addition, I wanted to let everyone know that we did lift the burn ban that we had put in place um, after the moisture that we've had in the last uh, few days. Uh, there is a positive side to snow. It allows us to lift a burn ban. So um, I know the folks out in Cal Colorado got a lot of snow this week, and they'd been praying for that too to try to um, deal with all their forest fires out there. So uh, snow can be a good thing at a, on time. So um, I think that's it for old business. Anything else? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Aye. Hershey? Aye. Forrest? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week.